postdoc research. He's currently a postdoc research fellow at the University of British Columbia. Uh, his research focuses on potential field data processing, interpretation, and also forward inverse um, uh, modeling. Uh, in the meantime, he, he's also uh, committed to developing open source scientific tools. So he's one of the maintainers of Fandiendo the Terror since he started his PhD. And also he's now uh, one of the maintainers for Simpac, which you all have seen, um, you also have used a couple a couple of weeks ago. So and he, um, he's motivated and committed to, uh, to contribute to, um, to build a more open, reproducible, inclusive, accessible, and equitable science. So it's my great pleasure to, um, to, to welcome Dr. Solia to speak to us. So let's welcome Dr. Celia and take it away. Thank you, Chacha. Thank you for the invitation. Let me share screen first. Uh, let's try this. Okay. And then, okay. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed receiving that email. And yeah, I hope you you like the talk I prepared. Um, so uh, the title of the talk is Modernizing Gravity Processing and why we should be using as geophysicists the gravity disturbance. Um, so since you already took some classes of gravity um, general potential fields theory, I thought it would be interesting to do some sort of kind of half of the talk, kind of a lecture on uh, explaining a little bit more on why we should be using gravity disturbance instead of things like the gravity anomaly and the free air anomaly. And then on the second part, I will try to go and do some live coding so you can actually see how we can actually use it and process gravity data with open source tools. Um, so, a little bit about me, uh, besides, okay, is it good? Are you listening to me good? Yeah, yeah, I, okay. I'm listening, so you're good. Okay, awesome. Um, so I, yeah, I put a little details about me besides the one that Jaja already explained. Uh, yeah, I'm a PhD in geophysics from Argentina. I'm currently working as a postdoc here at UBC and I'm currently maintaining and developing Simpex since I started uh, working here, but I've been involved in the development of Fatiando Terra, which is uh, another project for developing open source Python tool for geophysics that was born in Brazil. And yeah, I joined from Argentina uh, pretty early in early days of it. And I leave you here my website in case you want to check out what I'm doing and the things I, I have uh, I have been worked on. Um, so let's start with something very simple and a motivation slide, basically. Why do we measure gravity fields? So here I have a very cartoonish model of the subsurface where we have like a background density of rho zero. And then we have two spherical bodies, one with rho one and another one with a density of rho two. And the rho one is less dense than the background while the rho two is more dense than the background. So if we walk to the field and stand above each one of these two objects, we'll feel a gravitational attraction, of course. Um, if we stand on the on top of the more dense body, the row two one, the gravitational attraction will be greater than if we stand on the row one, right? And the reason behind it is because basically like the, um, the gravitational uh, law uh, will impose a, a stronger force on the denser body than in the less dense body. So basically, we measure gravity because we can infer the location of bodies that have some sort of density contrast with their background. But the gravity effects that these bodies generate are usually very small. Their signal, it's very small. So we need to be very accurate on measuring gravity fields. That's why gravimeters are super accurate instruments, but we also need to be very accurate while processing those fields. So let's move on to a refresher on gravity theory. 
So let's go back to a similar example where we are, we are standing on any point of the surface of the Earth. And uh, in that point, we will feel a gravitational attraction that we can uh, name it the gravity acceleration. And uh, since the gravity acceleration is derived from a, a conservative field, we can define a gravity potential, which is uh, basically if we compute the gradient of that potential W, you, we will get the gravity acceleration we can actually measure. This acceleration can be uh, split in two components. So one component is the actual gravitational acceleration because we are interacting gravitationally with the mass that is below our feet. And then the other part is the centrifugal acceleration because we are standing on the surface of the earth and the earth is spinning. We are not in, um, we are standing on a non-inertial reference uh, system. Therefore, we have to add that centrifugal acceleration. And as we did with the gravity acceleration, we can do the same with the gravitational with the gravity potential, split it in two between the gravitational potential and the centrifugal potential. One important thing that every time we discuss about fields um, is the ability to define a key potential surfaces. A key potential surfaces are basically 2D surfaces where the um, the potential is constant throughout every point in the surface. And in gravity, there is a particular um, a key potential surface that we actually define and give a name to it, which is the geoid. And it's basically the a key potential surface of the gravity field that matches the sea level. But when we go to the field, uh, usually with a gravimeter, what do we actually measure there? Do we measure the gravity potential? Do we measure the three components of the acceleration? The reality is that the gravimeters allow us to measure the strength of that acceleration only. So we get just a scalar, not the full vector. And when we go to the field and put the gravimeter and measure, we actually measure the whole gravity signal of the whole Earth, right? And here I show you a map a global map of the observed gravity. Um, and as you can see, there are a few um, textures that you can see there, but mostly that gravity field, the observed gravity field, uh, is controlled by the whole mass of the Earth. So basically the whole signal is not too helpful for identifying uh, this type of objects that have some sort of density contrast. So what we need to do in order to see anomalous bodies is to define normal Earth. And the way that geodesists uh, thought about defining this normal Earth is through a reference ellipsoid. So a reference ellipsoid is like an ellipsoid, ellipsoid of revolution that approximates the geoid. And these uh, ellipsoids of revolution have a very interesting mathematical property, which is that they are it's themselves their own key potential surface. So basically what we can do is define um, a, a, a reference uh, potential U and assign one particular value to be the reference ellipsoid. That would be like at a one particular um, a key potential surface where this potential takes this uh, this value that one will be defining it as the reference ellipsoid. And it's actually the one that approximates better to that geoid. So now that we have a reference ellipsoid that it, it's, uh, it is its own a key potential surface, we can define the normal gravity, right? And the normal gravity is easily defined as the gradient of that potential U, and that's a vector. But the normal gravity itself, the quantity, we usually uh, define it as the strength of that vector. And you probably saw in some of the classes a formula to compute that um, the normal gravity on any point of the ellipsoid, which is usually called the Somilian equation, that it's very simple. Here I wrote it down 
uh, it just you just need the normal gravity on the ellipsoid, the latitude where you want it, and some uh, properties of the ellipsoid. Um, keep that in mind for now. So now that we have a normal Earth and we have the observed gravity that we can go to the field and actually measure, we can now define some sort of anomalous field of or disturbance, and these are two different definitions of two different quantities. First is the what we call the classical gravity anomaly, which is basically the observed gravity that we measure in the field minus the normal gravity on the surface of the ellipsoid. And then this another quantity uh, is the gravity disturbance that is the same observed gravity minus the normal gravity at the same point. So to put an example, can you see the pointer, Jaja? Yes. Yes? OK, we great. We can see it. Thank you. Um, so let's say we go to the field and measure the gravity here on top of this hill, right? So if I want to compute the gravity anomaly, I take the value of the gravity I measure here in this point, and I remove the normal gravity on this point of the ellipsoid. But if I want to compute the gravity disturbance, what I need to do is to remove from the observed gravity the normal gravity in this point, OK? So the gravity, mm, I think I, OK. So the gravity disturbance basically accounts for the effect, the gravity effect, the gravitational effect of all the anomalous masses in the Earth, right? Well, and here I can show you a global map of the gravity disturbance uh, taken uh, from satellite data. This is uh, observations at uh, 10 kilometers above the ellipsoid. And you can actually see that the gravity disturbance deviates from zero to negative and positive values, right? The gravity anomaly, on the other hand, accounts for the same effect of all the anomalous masses in the Earth plus some extra effect of not accounting the observation height when we remove the normal gravity term. So if I plot, for example, a global map of the gravity anomaly uh, with the same observations at 10 kilometers above the ellipsoid, you can see that these do not deviate from zero. Right? I'm actually using another uh, color map to make it very clear. But if you see the values, they are not around zero they're all shifted towards negative. And the reason behind it is that the gravity anomaly itself is not accounting for that high difference. It's not accounting for the observation of the point when removing the normal gravity term. So this is why geodesists introduce a free air anomaly. So, but before I get into the math of the free air anomaly, I want to tell you a little bit of, about the history of it. So, it's not that geodesists were doing things in the wrong way. It's that they were doing the best they could with the tools they have back in the time. So back in the days when people didn't, like we didn't have GPS because it, it wasn't invented yet, uh, the only way to compute heights was with theodolites that were able to uh, measure accurately orthometric heights, which are heights above the ellipsoid. So if in the... Um, in the image that I took from one of the classes, one of Jaja's classes um, here, they were they were able to measure the capital H height, right? Um, the other thing that we need to consider is that the free air, the sorry, the normal gravity term on the ellipsoid, on the surface of the ellipsoid, it's a very simple equation to compute. Remember, before we had computers, someone will have to go and compute it manually. So that's another reason why this approach of going through um, normal gravity and then applying a freer correction made sense back then. So that being said, let's move on to freer correction. So let's say I want to compute the normal gravity at one point at a point P that is uh, above the geoid at uh, a height at orthometric height h, capital H here. So, and let's say we define r as the vector that goes from the center of the Earth to that point in the geoid. 
So if I want to compute the normal gravity on that point, I can write it down as the normal gravity on the geoid, basically in this point, plus a correction term that I will call free air correction. And since the radius that the magnitude of that vector r is much greater than the height, the orthometric height h, I can actually use a Taylor series expansion to approximate this free air correction. So basically I could write the normal gravity on this point P in this way, and this could be our free air correction term that we can write this, write it as this in this form. So if we take only the first order of that, uh, of that expansion, uh, we can get that the, the correction term can be approximated by just the first derivative uh, times h, oh, sorry, I put an n here, n should be one here. Um, but basically we can make it linear to the orthometric height. And if we approximate this normal gravity on any point of the, of, of the space by the gravity of a sphere, would would be this one, uh, the correction term would look like this. And if R is equal to the mean Earth radius and the G evaluated in R is the normal gravity at that at that location, uh, that would be the like 9.8, for example, we'll get with uh, we'll get this famous formula of the Fourier correction, which is basically just one constant, one negative constant times the orthometric height. Just one note, this constant is expecting that the height is in meters and it will return the normal gravity in milligol. There are a few changes you need to apply if you want to work in other units. But keep that in mind. The freer correction could be just like a linear correction on the height. And with that correction, we can define the freer anomaly. The freer anomaly by definition is the gravity anomaly minus the freer correction. So, and because the free the gravity anomaly, this one was just the observed gravity minus the normal gravity on the surface of the ellipsoid, we just need to remove the the freer correction here, and we get the freer anomaly to be this formula. This one, if you remember, here the normal gravity on the ellipsoid, it's a pretty simple uh, equation to compute. This correction is very simple to compute. So this um, obtaining this quantity back in the days before we had computers, it was a fairly simple thing to do. So uh, going back to the uh, one slide I showed you before, just as a reminder, the gravity anomaly itself was accounting for the effect of all the anomalous masses in the earth plus the effect of not accounting the observation height on the normal gravity term. But when we apply the free air anomaly, like the free air correction to it and get the free air anomaly, now this one accounts only for the anomalous masses in the Earth. So we remove that uh, dependence on the observation height through the correction. And here I can show you a global map of the free air anomaly again, uh, with observations at 10 kilometers above the ellipsoid. And now you can see that they deviate from zero. They actually look an, an, like an anomaly. But free air anomaly has a few disadvantages. The first one is pretty straightforward. It's just a first order approximation of the actual normal gravity. And remember that I was saying that we need to be very accurate when processing gravity because the whole field requires that. Um, and for a lot of applications, this first order approximation works well, but there are a lot of different applications where, where this is not enough. The second disadvantage is that it actually depends on orthometric heights. And there are a few problems with that. First one is that uh, in the classical definition, at least, the free air anomaly doesn't account for the high corrections between the ellipsoid and the geoid. 
it's actually using orthometric heights. So there is a little gap between the ellipsoid and the geoid that is not being accounted for. The second thing is that orthometric heights change in time. And why is that? Orthometric heights are defined on the geoid. And the geoid is an equipotential surface of the gravity field of the Earth, right? But the gravity field of the Earth depends on the distribution of masses in the Earth. And masses move in the Earth. One clear example is when we have like ice melting in, in, in the poles, for example, we can actually measure that through gravity. So there is a redistribution of masses and that changes the geoid. Therefore, orthometric heights change in time. So it's not a very suitable reference system. And then uh, nowadays that we have GPS and GPS measurements are ubiquitous on any geophysical survey, we actually don't need to depend on orthometric heights for this. We can just work with ellipsoidal heights. And the last disadvantage uh, I find is that free air anomaly and gravity anomaly have multiple definitions. And there are different like historical reasons on that, um, different applications and why those um, different definitions were created. But it's really hard when someone hands you in like a free air anomaly data set to know what actual definition were they using to compute it? How did they compute it? So this is a, uh, an opinion I, I built from, from getting into this subject uh, for a while. And my conclusion is just use the gravity surface. But one can say, okay, in order to get the gravity disturbance, uh, I can go to the field, observe, uh, measure the gravity field, and I need to remove the normal gravity at that same point. But how can we do that? Because it's not that easy, right? Well, there is a paper from 2001 from Leon Gotze that provided a closed for formula for the normal gravity on any point of space. The equation is the, yeah, the formula for computing it is not straightforward. So here I show you like in one line, the equation and probably if you're, uh, if you take a look at it, you will see that the normal gravity depends on the latitude and the height, but you cannot see any latitude or, or height inside the formula. And that's because there are a lot of intermediate variables in it. So the actual formula to compute it's a little bit long, but we have open source tools to compute it. And that's the cool thing. We have it implemented this formula in Bool, which is one of the libraries of the of Patiando Terra, which is the project I, I developed. Um, and Bool is a nice library that allow us to define some reference ellipsoids and provide us uh, methods like, for example, the normal gravity to compute the normal gravity on any point of space. So for example, here in this snippet, I'm in this line, I'm importing the library. I'm defining one particular ellipsoid that is built in in the library. For example, the WGS84 one that is uh, pretty famous. Um, and then if you want to compute, for example, the normal gravity at the latitude of Houston, we can provide just the latitude to the normal gravity method, provide a height. I say like, let's compute it at 1.5 kilometers above the ellipsoid. And then that easy, you can get it. So some demo time. Uh, let me show you some live coding, moving to like the second part of the talk. Um, so I prepared one notebook where I can show you how we can use this open source tools to actually do some gravity data processing. But before that, any questions so far? So a quick question. So, uh, San Diego, so I think the normal gravity, uh, that is a gravity we would expect, uh, at some height, some elevation due to a a uh, uniform ellipsoid, is that right? Is that the, the thing that you, you subtract from the measured gravity? 
uh, normal yes. RP defined um, based on the ellipsoid. Right? It's just that you can calculate anywhere on the surface or anywhere above the surface of the ellipsoid. Is that right? Yeah, the normal okay. gravity, it's the um, the magnitude of the acceleration mm -hmm. that would create just the reference ellipsoid. OK. So and, uh, for the ellipsoid, yeah. uh, are we uh, are we using a uniform density, or is it is it like a layered Earth model? Or Very good question. Yeah. So um, the density distribution of the reference ellipsoid is a non-unique problem. Basically, uh, you can yeah. define a lot of different density distributions and obtain exactly the same uh, potential. Um, Usually by normal Earth, uh, in geophysics, we we define this layer Earth, basically. But it's a little bit of like a thumb rule. It's not like um, written in stone. But it's that, OK, you have like the crust uh, of like 35 kilometers, maybe. And from there, then you have the mantle with a certain density and there are some values that are like the mean values throughout the um, the globe and usually we use that definition and those values of the normal earth to um, interpret basically the density contrast we can see or we can infer from the the gravity disturbance so basically if we see a bump in the gravity disturbance that aligns with a density contrast of um, of 0 0.2 speaking in grams per centimeter square, for example, uh, we would say like, okay, the density of that body is the background density of the normal earth. That would be, for example, 2.67 if it's in the crust, plus that 0 0.2. Does it make okay. sense? Okay. So another question we're really trying to understand is, so the gravity disturbance it's basically similar to free air anomaly, just that now you're using uh, using the ellipsoid as a measure of the of the height above the surface instead of using the the geoid. Is that right? Uh, yes. Let me show you one slide before. I'm trying to understand the difference between free air and yeah. the disturbance. I think the the difference lies in the um, orthometric height. Yeah. Um, so for gravity disturbance, uh, you don't. I don't care exactly which reference system you are using, which type of height you are using. I'm only caring on the fact that the I'm removing the value of the normal Earth on the same point where I observe the gravity. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the only effect I have left is the gravitational effect of the anomalous masses. Okay. Be with the gravity anomaly, the difference, just the gravity anomaly, uh, I'm removing from the observed gravity, the normal gravity on the ellipsoid. Mm -hmm. So you have that gap between the where you measure and where like the normal gravity where you're removing it from. So you have to account for that high difference, and that high difference is introduced in the uh, uh, yeah here in the freer correction basically, and in order in the way we the literature usually introduce that correction is by applying this Taylor series approximation of like yeah. okay I, I don't know exactly what the difference is, but I can just approximate it. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And that's how you remove it. In the end, these two fields should be pretty similar, but there are some issues, for example, the fact that in the classical definition, the freer uh, correction is defined using the geoid height. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you go here, you'll be, you have the observed gravity here, you'll remove the normal gravity on the ellipsoid, Oh, there's a discrepancy and then, using two different reference systems. Yeah, and then you will apply the correction accounting only for this height. So yeah, there yeah. is a gap here that you're not accounting it for. Okay, the GI the height. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So basically um the gravity disturbance is the is an improvement over the freer correction um, by taking into taking into account that uh, GI height 
end here in, in this diagram. Yeah, and also I would say uh, we are not approximating it by any yeah. means. It's the actual analytic solution for it. Okay. And one important mm -hmm. reason for that is that if you are trying to do, uh, like let's say it's some satellite uh, processing, for example, where you have the gravity on satellite height, the um, the orbit of the satellite uh, could uh, could in, I mean using the Taylor series approximation with satellite heights would introduce a lot of error. Yeah, significant, yeah, yeah. not like a lot, a lot, but it could introduce significant error mm -hmm. because now the height it's considerable. It's not like you're so close to the yeah, geo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, got you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no worries. Any further questions? Okay. Um, so as I was saying, let me show you some notebook. Um, so uh, yeah, I prepared a notebook um, where I'm planning to do some great data processing, applying some of the concepts I explained today, um, and also using all open source tools and the gravity data set I will be using. It's also uh, open access, so you can go and download it. Um, I will share a link. There is in, it's in one of the slides, but I have all the code here in this repository. Uh, I actually can share it on Zoom Pro. Eh? So if you want to take a look at it and there, okay, what is it? Chat here. Um, in that repository, you can find the, the notebook itself if you want to play with it. Um, and also if you want to run it in Colab, um, for one package, you will need um, uh, Conda to be installed. So I have instruction here on how to run, like configure your Google call app to be able to run this notebook. Um, but yeah, we can we can see if we can uh, do some some practical coding by the end. Even if you have any trouble, we can troubleshoot it. So. Um, here I prepared the notebook. There are some missing um, cells, like they're in blank, like this one, where that I will be completing as I write. So uh, here I'm importing a few um, a few libraries, like NumPy, Pandas, XArray. XArray, maybe you're not too familiar with it. Uh, XArray is like Pandas uh, that allows you to work with um, uh, with tables, tabular data. But X-Array allows you to work with multidimensional data, which is great for handling, for example, two-dimensional grids. Then I will use PyProj, which is a very nice Python uh, library for applying uh, projections. So going from um, geographical uh, coordinates to plane coordinates. Then PyGMT, uh, it's a Python wrapper for GMT that would allow us to plot very nice looking maps. And then here I have four uh, of the li of the Fatiando libraries I will be using today. And Sayo is a library for downloading sample data sets we have, uh, we host. Um, Verde is a nice tool for doing some coordinate management and also some interpolations. Bool is the one I talked to you about that allow us to define um, these reference ellipsoids and do calculations like the normal gravity and harmonica it's the the big potential fields library we have in 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 fatiando that allows you to do like forward modeling of different uh geometries um uh, uh equivalent sources uh applying filters to mac data a lot of different things so uh let's start by downloading the gravity data set i want to use today, and I will be using Ensayo for that. So what I'm going to do is define fname, and I will make it equal to Ensayo.fetch uh, Southern Africa. Okay, let me run first this cell so I can have auto completion. Okay. Uh, let's download first the gravity data set from Southern Africa. 
and I will say, download me the version one. So inside is very neat because what it will do, it will, it will download the file from the web and it will store it in a cache folder in my own computer. So I already have it, for example. So I will be able to use it and reuse it anytime. So I don't need to go and download, download it every time. Um, and once I have it, if you can see, it's a CSV file, which I can open with pandas. So I can use say data equal pandas, uh, read CSV and pass the name of the file and then read the file. So this file has uh, four, uh, 14,000 uh, observations and it has the longitude, latitude and height over the sea level. Every time you see height over sea level, it's usually the geoid, it's above the geoid. And the gravity, the observed gravity on each one of these points. And here in this cell I, I have here, I will use PyGMT to plot it, plot this data set. And maybe you can recognize here the shore of Southern Africa. And here is where we have all the points. Uh, check it out that here we are actually seeing the observed gravity. That's why the values are around this, uh, yeah, nine, eight, nine, seven, right? Um, okay, so I mentioned that this data set provides, it's a fairly old data set, so that's why it provides height over sea level and not uh, ellipsoidal heights. So one thing we need to do in order to apply, uh, to compute the gravity disturbance is to convert this um, orthometric heights to ellipsoidal heights. And the way to do that is to just basically sum the, um, the geoid height to these uh, orthometric heights. And for that, we need a geoid. But in Ensayo, we have a global geoid. Uh, so I can do F name equal Ensayo fetch, uh, and I think it's geoid or oh, earth geoid. Yeah, earth geoid, also the version one of it. And again, it will download a file with the global geoid and it will save it as a netcdf file that we can open with X-Array. So I would say geoid equal X-Array open uh, data array and pass the F name. And if we run it, X-Array will open it and uh, it will show it the geoid this way. So X-Array is a package for multi-dimensional arrays. And here we have two coordinates, the longitude and the latitude. And uh, let me see if I can show it to you. Okay. And then the actual geoid is a two-dimensional array with one of the dimensions will be the longitude and the other dimension will be the latitude. And here I can actually plot it using PyGMT. Okay, so here's a global map of that to the array, and which is the geoid height. So what we want to do is to get the geoid height on the same locations of the observed gravity. So we can actually compute the ellipsoidal heights for each one of those observations. So before we do that, we would like to cut or crop this data set uh, focusing only on the southern part of Africa. And also one thing I want to do here is that instead of working on the whole data set, I want to focus on a very particular and interesting region that it's around here, which is the Bushville Ignus complex um, that has a very clear signal, uh, a very clear gravity signal. So the next thing is I will define a region for the Bushville Ignus complex, that will be this. And I can actually plot the, um, the data with like some box here for the region. And I can use here Verde and Verde has this inside function that allow us to compute um, the indices given a set of coordinates that lie within a particular region. So once we get those indices, 
we can pass it and filter the data only to the points that lie inside that region. So for example, here, if I run it, instead of having the 14,000 data points I had initially, now I have only 4,000 data points, roughly. And I can, I can actually plot these data points. And here are the observed right data points on the Bushwell Ignus complex region. And I would I would like to do the same, something similar of cropping the area for the geoid. So I can actually get measurements of the geoid in each on each one of these locations. And uh, one thing I will do is I will instead of cropping to this exactly the same region, I will crop it to a region, a region that is a little bit bigger, which I will call uh, region pad. And I can get that padded region with Verde. Verde has a nice function it's called pad region that allows you to extend a particular region, in this case, five degrees to each side. So for example, here I will run it and I will get a region that is slightly uh, uh, larger than the, the original one. And X-Array allows, allows us to easily crop our two-dimensional grid with this cell method, passing which uh, longitude and latitude slice do we want, how do we want to cut it. And I can just run this cell and I can plot it. Let's plot the geoid only in that uh, cropped region. And here you can see that it's mostly the geoid is mostly uh, above the ellipsoid in in this region, right? But this is only a two-dimensional grid. So we, what we want to get actually is of measurements of the geoid on each one of the observation points. And to do that, we need to interpolate this two-dimensional grid on each one of the data points we have. So. In order to apply an interpolator, um, I'm going to use Verde that has uh, quite a bunch of different interpolators, but those interpolators work only on plane coordinates, not on latitude and longitude coordinates. So before I can interpolate those, I need to uh, apply a projection to get them from geographic coordinates to plane coordinates. And I can use PyProj for that, so I can just go and define a given projection that I would do that with iProj.proj and I can define a Mercator projection and passing the mean latitude of the data for it. So I define the projection and then I can just use the projection by passing the longitude and latitude values of the data. And that way I can define the easting and northing in meters for each one of the observed data points. And here, what I'm doing is assigning this easting and northing column to the data frame, to the pandas data frame. So if I run this cell, I will be projecting the longitude and latitude columns using that Mercator projection to easting and northing and adding these two columns to the data frame, okay? Is it clear enough, this one? Okay. Um, then I want to do the same with the geoid because the geoid as well is in geographic coordinates, but I want it in the same projection. So what I want to do is to project this region, the geoid, but the geoid's already a grid. So I can use uh, verde.project grid that will allow us to pass a given two-dimensional grid, a given projection, and which method we'll be using to interpolate that uh, projection, that projected coordinate for the grid. So if I run this cell, I will get a few warnings that, yeah, there are future warnings coming from pandas that we are taking care of that right now, uh, but ignore that for now. So what we will get is another uh, geo grid that it's also a two-dimensional array, but now instead of being defined on longitude and latitude, it's defined on easting and northing, and these two are in meters. So 
basically what we did is project the data points, project the geoid, and now what we want to do, now that we have them in projected coordinates, is to actually get the values of the geoid on each one of the observation points. So if I go down, I can convert that two-dimensional grid of the geoid into a table, like columns, basically, and define a cubic interpolator. And basically, uh, we would, we, what will we do is that is fit this interpolator with the coordinates of the geoid and the geoid height, and then use that same interpolator to predict here the values of the geoid on each one of the observation points. And that will get us the, the geoid height for each one of the observation points. And then we can define the geometric height, which is the ellipsoidal height, by computing the sum between the height above the sea level plus the geoid height in that same location. So if I run this, we'll have a few more columns into our, our table, which is the geoid at each one of the locations and the ellipsoidal height on each one of these locations as well. This was a kind of a long process, but in summary, what I want to highlight is that we started from observations that only had heights above the geoid, this column. We had a global geoid grid. And what we did is compute the geoid heights on each one of the observation points. And by adding that geoid height to the sea level height, we can get the ellipsoid height, which is this one. Okay, is it clear enough, Jaja? Any questions, students? Uh, any questions from the students? So we didn't really uh, talk about uh, the process in class. So if you have any questions, go ahead. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask about um, like RAM capacity of the CPU. Is this normal um, capacity or memory? Or if I want to do this, I need to, I can do it on my normal computer, right? Yeah, yeah, this uh this notebook particularly, um there's only one step probably further down that would require a little bit more RAM, but uh you can totally run it in Google Call out that provides you I think two gigabytes of RAM. So basically, yeah, you can you can run it on any computer. Okay, but thank you. Thanks for asking. That's a very good question. Okay, uh, shall I move on? Yeah, I think, yeah, let, let's move on. Yeah. Okay, how much time do I have, Jaja, left? Uh, 30, 40 minutes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 30 minutes, yeah. Um, okay, so next step, let's compute the gravity disturbance, the big thing I've been talking about today. So remember, Gravity disturbance would be the observed gravity, we have that one here, minus the normal gravity at the same locations where I make the measurements. So what we need to do actually right now is compute the normal gravity. And to do that, we need to choose which reference ellipsoid we are going to use. I will choose WGS84 because it's like the mostly used one. So I can define that ellipsoid using bool. So I can put ellipsoid equal bool dot WGS 84. And I can actually print it. So you can actually take a look at it. So this is the ellipsoid has the name, the some of the properties like the semi-major axis, the flattening, the geocentric gravity constant, basically what defines the actual ellipsoid. And once I define that ellipsoid, I can go and compute the normal gravity by saying normal gravity will be equal to the ellipsoid 
dot normal gravity. And for the normal gravity, I can show you the documentation here. I need to pass the latitude and the height of each one of the observation points where I want to compute the normal gravity. So I can basically do data dot uh, longitude, sorry, latitude. It's fine, right? Yeah, latitude. And data, and I'm going to use the height over the ellipsoid, not the height over the geoid, the one that I just computed in the whole process I had before. So data, height, and it was geometric. So uh, by doing so, we'll get a single column of all the values of the normal gravity on each one of the observation points we have in the data set. And then what I can do is compute the disturbance as the observed gravity, data dot gravity milligal, which is the one, the observed gravity in the data set, minus the normal gravity. And disturbance, disturbance here. And by running this, you can see we have another column that has value that these are positive. Here we have one negative. So basically they deviate from zero kind of symmetrically, basically. So I can assign it to the data frame to get another column with the disturbance. So here I have the extra column I just computed and I can actually go and plot the disturbance. And here you can see it. Um, so red values are positive gravity disturbance, negative values are negative value, uh, negative gravity disturbance values. Okay. Any questions so far? I think we're good. Cool. Okay. Uh, since I have time, I can move on and keep doing some other task. Uh, I didn't know if I would I would have time to do it, but apparently I have. So I, I didn't talk too much about it in the in the slides, but I can show you very quickly now that uh, how to perform another type of corrections using also open source tools. So the um, in the classical literature, the other correction you'll be able to find is the terrain correction. So the gravity disturbance, even like the, the free air anomaly, they both have, um, are basically heavily uh, controlled by the topography. And think about it, we are removing the normal earth and the normal earth is just the ellipsoid. So when we remove the normal earth, all the masses that are above the ellipsoid have a very high density contrast, like basically the act, their actual density, while the masses that are below the ellipsoid will have a density contrast as the difference between the background density and their density, their own density. So basically, this is highly controlled by all the topographic masses. And if we are interested in taking a look at an inferred location of anomalous bodies, we need to get rid of that effect from the topography. So what we can do is to apply a terrain correction. And how to do that, uh, there are different ways. The way I'm going to show you here is to download um, a, um, a grid of the topography, like a DEM, a digital elevation model. And I will use harmonica to create rectangular prisms to model the topography with these prisms. And I will assign the particular density to the prisms and I will forward model the effect of those prisms on each one of the observation points, right? So I can just go and start by downloading um, a topography for the whole globe here. Also from Ensayo, we have deferred the fetch earth topography uh, function here. And I can just go and download it fairly easy. I can cut it to the, the region I use for cropping the geoid as well. So I can just go and do it. 
And once I have this grid, it's in longitude and latitude, I can plot it. And here you can see, this is the topography grid. It's not a high resolution grid. And mainly because I didn't want this notebook to take a long time to compute. So this is a low resolution, but it will work for, for the example I want to show. And so here is the topography grid. And on top of that is the gravity disturbance we just computed, right? So this region is a little bit uh, larger than the actual region where we have the data. And the reason behind it is that is because we want to avoid having uh, border effects. So if we limit only to the region of the data, uh, we'll have uh, some errors in the border because we are not accounting for masses that are slightly like close to, to the edge, basically. Um, so one thing I can do is again, project this grid because the formalling I'm going to use requires the topography to be defined in plane coordinates in meters because I'm going to use just rectangular prisms. Um, so I can just go and project the grid as I did with the geoid here to obtain the projected topography grid. Um, so now we have the same grid, but now it's in easting and northing, not in longitude and latitude. And one other thing is that this topography grid is um is downloaded from uh, a topo, which is a a well known topography model for the whole Earth, and this. Uh, topographic heights are also above the geoid. So what we want to do is to compute the geometric heights, which is the heights above the ellipsoid. So the topography above the ellipsoid by summing the topography we downloaded plus the geoid on the same points. And that, that way we can obtain the topography above the ellipsoid and not above the geoid. So once we do that, we can just go and define a model of rectangular prisms for the whole topography. So I what I'm doing here is assigning a density for each one of these prisms where I'm saying like, okay, if the height is, if you're above the ellipsoid, assign a density of 2,670 kilograms per meter cubic. Uh, but if you're below, we are going to assume here that we have water in there. So the density for the water should be the density contrast between the water and the density of the normal earth in that region, which is the normal crust. So here we'll have the density of the water minus the density of the normal crust, basically. And this is why we'll have a negative density contrast where we have the C in this case. Um, so with that, we can get a density array for each one of the prisms, the ones that are above the topography and also the ones that uh, we where we have bathymetry and we have the C. And then with harmonica, we can define a prism layer that will take basically the coordinates of the topography grid, the easting and northing ones. It will take a surface that will be the topography, actually and then a reference that will set to zero. So basically what it's doing is that on continent, you'll have the prism going like this and on the water, we'll have the prisms going below the ellipsoid. That's why we have a reference equal to zero. And for the properties, we are assigning just the density as the array we define here. And with that, we can define our topography model, which is uh, also it's a data set where we have the easting and northing 
these are the coordinates of the center of each one of the prisms. And then we have the top and bottom of each one of these prisms. So in this case, we'll have, again, reference zero for the, um, for the continent and the topography above. And then for the water, we'll have a top of zero and then the bathymetry below. And then as a data variable, we'll have the density array we just defined, which actually we can see here a few different values, like here a continent and here we have ocean in this case. Okay, so now that we have built our model of prisms, we can go and compute the gravity effect of those prisms on each one of the observation points. So I can just go and define this coordinates tuple, which is basically the easting, northing, and height of each one of the observation points. Um, and then compute the terrain effect by calling topography model, which is the model I just defined here, and using the uh, the successor, which is prism layer dot gravity, and passing the coordinates where I want to compute the gravity field on, and also specifying which field I want to compute. And in this case, I'm only worried about the set component of the acceleration. So in one line, I can just go and compute the terrain effect. And once I have it, I can define the Bouguer disturbance, which is the disturbance minus the terrain effect. Okay. And finally here, I will just assign these two new uh, arrays into our data frame so we can have more columns in there. So let's run this. This one will take a few seconds because the four modeling stage it's a little bit demanding on CPU, but since the model is not like super high resolution, it didn't take too long. If you are using a very a high resolution DEM, this could probably take a few more minutes. So here we have the data frame and you have here the two new columns, the terrain effect and the gravity booger, the booger disturbance basically. And let's plot the Bouguer disturbance to see how it looks. Here, I have this cell to plot it using PyGMT. And here's the disturbance. And it's mostly negative values. And I think you, you know why this is happening. I will give you a tip. So in this area, we have topography. So if we have topography, what happens below? Anyone? <clears throat> we briefly talked about this in class, right? Um, the isostatic thing, uh, anyone still remember? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. So what, ha what happens is that um, when you have uh, uh, when you have terrain, high terrain, uh, there is an isostatic uh, response on the on the boundary between the crust and the mantle. So basically, in order to have more mass here, we need to have more mass below shifting away the mantle so we can balance the buoyancy of the crust in that region. So basically what's happening here is that the moho, the moho um, discontinuity in the mantle between the mantle and the crust, it's a little bit deeper than on the normal crust. And when you move away mantle and you occupy that space with crust, you're actually having negative density contrast because the crust is less dense than the mantle. And since this is pretty deep, this looks like a regional field 
that affects the entire survey area. So one way to remove that effect, there are different ways. One way would be, for example, to actually compute like an isostatic balance and forward model like an isostatic moho. Uh, that, that could be one way. Another way would be to actually remove a regional field. And for defining a regional field, so when we remove a regional field, we'll get a residual gravity field. And this regional field can be defined in many ways. One way I'd like to show you today is that we can actually define equivalent sources for the regional field. So I can use harmonica to define deep sources. So using the equivalent sources class, I can set very, very deep sources. Uh, in this case, it's uh, um, 500 kilometers, so pretty deep. And what I'm going to do is to use these sources to feed the data. But since they are very deep, they are only going to generate, be able to generate a very smooth field. They're not go going to be able to generate exactly the same field. And I can use that smooth field, the equivalent sources generate as the regional field. And in the feeding process of the equivalent sources, uh, I'm going to use the damping, which if you already use uh, Simpeg, you're maybe familiar with the beta um, uh, parameter that basically allows you to uh, introduce more to prioritize more the data misfit or the regularization term. And here we are doing something similar. We have like a regularization term and with a high damping, we are going to produce more smooth results than with a low damping. So I'm just going to use a very high damping of 1000. That's pretty high. And once I define these sources, I'm going to feed them with the, um, with the coordinates of the observation points, sorry, here, and with the Bouguer disturbance, I just computed this one, right? So once I fit the sources, I'm obtaining the coefficients of these sources, and I can reuse those sources to predict the gravity field on the same locations uh, of the observation points. So here I'm getting the prediction of those deep sources, and I would call that prediction the regional field. And once I do that, I can just remove that regional field from the Bouguer disturbance in order to obtain the residual field. And finally, I can just go and add that residual field to another column of our data frame. So if I run this cell, Okay, here it is. Uh, one comment um, related to the question uh, you asked me about the, um, the amount of memory. This step, if you have way more um, data points, it might need a lot of RAM and might need some heavy computations uh, because I'm actually feeding a queue and sources. And I think Judge had told you a little bit about like how intense uh, feeding a queue and sources might be. But for this particular case, we have not over 5,000 data points and should be enough with the amount of RAM you have in your computer. So in the, in the table, uh, I just added this uh, residual um, column and I can actually go and plot this here. And here, Hope you can see it well. Now it looks differently. Now we have one area of positive, this area of positive, and this area of, with a very high positive here, and then everything negative around it, and also inside here. So when we try to interpret this, now we can say, okay, I just removed the topography masses. I just removed the the very deep 
sources in the Moho, so I don't have that regional field. I might also remove in that regional field some other uh, long wavelength sources that might be around. So I could say that what I'm seeing right now is the signal of the pretty near surface um, bodies that lie in the, in, yeah, like under our feet, basically. But before I jump into interpreting these results, one thing I extra I can do to help the interpretation is to create a two-dimensional grid for this, because these are all scatter points. And can actually I can actually do uh, an interpolation also using equivalent sources, but instead of defining very deep equivalent sources, I can use a more shallow uh, set of sources. So I will be using harmonic equivalent sources, the same class, but instead of using a five thousand sorry five hundred kilometers, I'm going to use a ten kilometer depth for this, much more shallower. And I will also lower the damping because now I want these sources to be able to feed the data with much more accuracy than, than before. So once I define this other set of sources, I can use them to feed uh, the coordinates and the residual gravity we have plotted here. And once I feed those sources, instead of predicting on the same locations, now I want to predict on a two-dimensional grid at a constant height. So what I'm going to do is to use Verde to define a grid of coordinates. So I'm going to use um, the region of uh, that we use to cut the data. I'm going to use a spacing. Basically, this controls the resolution of the of the grid. And I'm going to create this grid in geographic coordinates instead of uh, defining the grid in, in plane coordinates. So these two over 60 are actually, a it's actually a resolution of um, two minutes in degrees, basically two, two arc minutes. And as the extra coordinates, I will put the height over the ellipsoid of this two dimensional grid. And um, for this, I choose uh, the maximum height we have in the data, uh, which is a little bit over two kilometers. And once I have these grid coordinates, I will call the grid method in the equivalent sources and pass where I want to predict and create this grid. And I can do some stuff like putting a data name for it, like gravity residual makes sense. Also changing the name of the dimensions because this grid is in in geographic coordinates, so the dimensions of the grid would be latitude and longitude. And since the data, it's remember when I fitted this, this data was in plane coordinates, but now the grid is in geographic coordinates. So I need a projection to convert from one to the other. So by doing that, I can just run this cell and get an error, okay? Oh, because I didn't run this one, <laughs> makes sense. Uh, so let's run this first, feed the Gillen sources, and then run this cell, cool. And uh, this residual grid, it's also a, an X-ray data set that contains the gravity residual and have three coordinates, although it's a two-dimensional grid, uh, it has the longitude, the latitude, and also it has the two-dimensional grid for the upper coordinates, which are all the same in this case. And we can just go and plot this two-dimensional grid here. And it looked like this. And one thing is that I added here the data points in this little black point, so you can get a sense of where the interpolation might be more or less accurate. Remember, if we're in locations where we have almost no, no um, data points, the interpolation is not going to be accurate because we don't have any data point to, to support it, basically. But it's fairly interesting that we can see these uh, gravity heights around here. And let me show you one geologic map of this area of the Bushville Igneous Complex. And 
here it is, the three sections of the igneous complex. And they resemble pretty well with the gravity anomalies we have here. So I think this is a very nice data set because with a few um, with a few steps in the middle, we can get to a map that we can actually interpret from just a grid without having to go on and invert this data. That will be probably the next process. Uh, and that will be an interesting one as well. But yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I think that one uh, is, I think this one is a very nice example on, on how to, we can process data. And again, I was using open source tools that you can go and download for free. Um, any questions on the notebook? So students, uh, you should have access to all the notebooks that um, Dr. Saudia shared um, through his uh, GitHub repository. Um, and uh, since we used, you already used the uh, used Google uh, Colab notebooks to to run in version. So basically, this pretty much the same procedure to follow in order to run these notebooks. Um, so if you, I don't think uh, you had a uh, had a chance to run it, but uh, all the materials, all the code, all the notebooks are, are there. So um, be sure to check it out or at least download it. So just in case you, you need to process your own gravity in the future, these are the resources you, you, can, you can use. Uh, any questions for Dr. Sawyer because before, before we call it the day? I don't have a question, but I do thank you for the notebook. Uh, this is going to be, this is going to be great to use in the future. Cool, thank you. Yeah, glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. It's a great talk. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, thank you, San Diego. Uh, so okay. in the class, we actually this year I got uh, so in previous years, um, I have like uh, two or three lectures uh, just talking about the. Uh, the different data processing techniques like free air anomaly, boogie anomaly. But this year I skipped all of them because I want to make some room for the guest lectures. Mm. So um, it's actually really, really glad to see that you uh, you talk about free air gravity anomaly, boogie anomaly, and you walk us through like step by step how to go from the raw data all the way to boogie data. So you actually feel the gap that I created. <laughs> okay. So, um, so students, awesome. you, you, you didn't miss anything. So everything I, I missed out, um, now, uh, Dr. Saudi, uh, um, fill, fill that gap for, for, for you all. Okay, so okay. if no, uh, any other question before we before we go? Okay, if not, then let's thank uh, Dr. Saudi again. Thank okay. you so much for um, speaking to us and walking us through step-by-step step how to use the open source um, packages to, to process data. This, this, this is really amazing. I probably will use it next year for uh, in my class for for students just to, just to try and see how uh, how they can actually process their data and come up with their own boogie gravity graded map. Cool, thank you, Chacha. I, I just wanted to finish with two more slides. Um, one of them is uh, I left some references uh, that were important while preparing some of the of the slides and provide some mathematical background. So if you want to check them out. Um, so the first one is for the, the one I mentioned that introduced the different type of gravity anomalies and has a very thorough mathematical background for it. And then the last one is the one that has the, um, the close for formula for the normal gravity. And yeah, with that, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for Jaja for the invitation and yeah, University of Houston for hosting the talk. I would like to thank Leo Yeda uh, for all the discussions that we had around gravity processing when, since I started my PhD. Uh, I think a lot of things in this talk came from that those discussions. And obviously to thanks, a huge thanks to the open source communities out there that makes possible to, to run everything. And some useful links. Um, so if you want to check the website of the project, it's fadiando.org. Uh, I also leave here a link to the repository and also a link to the slides if you want to download them. 
Um, I can share the link also to you, Jaja, if you want. Um, and they are also in the repository. So yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sorry. Thank you for everything for your for your presentation and also for the slides for all the open source materials you provide provided to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye everyone. Take care. Yep. Bye guys. Bye bye. Bye, San Diego. Thank you so much. Bye, Jaja. Thank you very much for the invitation. Really. Let me...